OK, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us all this afternoon. So um, just as I said, there's a few people popping in now, still arriving, I think we'll probably over the next few minutes. And um, for those of you who just joined, if you could just, if you didn't hear me, uh, just introduce yourself in the chat. That'd be really useful because we won't have a chance to go around uh, the room, as it were, the virtual room. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm James Diamond. I'm the Parks Development Manager at Nottingham City and Vice Chair of the Midlands Forum, and I'll be uh, chairing the meeting today. Um, so from the Midlands Forum board, we've also got Liz, our chair from the room. Say hello, Liz. Hello, everyone. And Alison, who's our partnership manager. Hello, everyone. Oh, great. Um, so, yeah, welcome, everybody. We've got quite a decent uh, chunky agenda to get through today. So the sort of first half is, as you can see, focused on uh, play. And then we've got a bit of a panel discussion set up afterwards. Um, with uh, four um, members of the forum to discuss uh, the uh, presentation we're going to have from the Association of Play Industries and then we'll have a chance for some Q&A after that. Uh, hopefully that'll be quite a hot topic for people with uh, obviously players reopening or or in the recent weeks or still to reopen in some cases and in some authorities. We're going to take a short break after that and then this afternoon um, at just after three o'clock we're going to have a presentation from Natural England about biodiversity net gain. So another very current topic at the moment. So, um, Alison, do you want to say anything in particular? We've got to welcome some new members here in particular, haven't we? Yeah, uh, you should see that on the screen now. We've got some new members um, from the East Midlands, Hinkley and Bosworth, Newark and Sherwood and Ashfield. Um, and we're also pleased to welcome Richard Hunt as a new volunteer to the forum team. Great. Yep. Thank you all. And thanks to those who are, who are joining or still processing the memberships as well. So our first item is um, Association of Play Industries. Now, we were hoping that Mark would be able to be with us today, but unfortunately couldn't due to personal reasons. So what we've got is a recording of his presentation anyway, which I'm going to share with you in just a second. Um, and then a panel discussion and Q&A after that. So without further ado, I will share the video. This is where we cross our fingers and hope the technology works. OK, if someone can let me know they can see that, OK? Yes, I can see. I can see it. OK, great. You, Mark. OK, um, all right, so my name is Mark Hardy. I'm the chairman of the Association of Play Industries. Um, the Association of Play Industries, is, as it sounds, is a membership organisation. We represent approximately, we can, we can never be um, dead on, but we represent approximately 80 to 85 percent of the UK market for um, playground manufacturers. And our members range from, um, you know, the guys who put safer surfacing down to um, the larger companies who I, I think you'd describe as sort of turnkey who will design, um, do the landscaping, do the safer surfacing, manufacture the equipment, install it, maintain it and so forth. So that, that full gamut. Um, our members, as, as you would imagine, supply and, and provide things like swings and roundabouts, um, but also um, sports, open use sports equipment. So multi-use games arenas, um, outdoor gym equipment, um, you know, youth shelters, things like that. Pretty much anything that you would see in a free access uh, park or, you know, around a community centre, all of that stuff is what our members provide. It's not a big market. It's not as big as you think. It's, it's pretty niche. Um, Overall, UK markets estimated around about £220 million a year. Um, our members you know, do something in the region of 180 to £190 million of that. Um, we operate a very strict um, membership code of practice and joining. And, and the reason for that uh, and why that's relevant here is actually knocking up a bit of play equipment isn't that difficult you know if, if it's steel you can you can probably easily find a welder and some tubes and, and put it together fairly easily and similarly if it's if it's timber you know there's an awful lot of um very low cost things that you can do with a, 
a couple of bits of plywood and, and some chain. Um, and so over the years, there have been an awful lot of companies have set up because they think they can make a fast buck and then have gone bust. So one of the criteria that we enforce quite rigorously is um, financial standing. We vet and audit the financials of our member companies because largely 80% of their business is with local authorities, uh, town um, and parish councils. So it, it's very important for the reputation of our members and the reputation of us as an organization that our, our membership is, is pretty robust. So that's the background, okay? Um, in terms of me, what are my qualifications to talk about this subject? My qualifications are exactly the same as yours. I was a kid. Uh, I played, um, I did run quite a large playground company for quite a time, which I, I, I guess qualifies me. But fundamentally, um, a lot of what I'm about to tell you and, and talk about is really common sense. Um, so let, let's get into the meat of, of, of what happened just over a week ago. Um, as you know, local authorities, parishes, towns have had the playgrounds closed now for 16, 17 weeks. Um, Boris announced that they would open on the 4th and um, MHCLG were kind of slow in putting their guidance document out, largely because the guidance document that they came up with, they talked to us about, and it was totally unworkable. Um, it was clear that they didn't really understand what um, local councils do. And it was even clearer that they, they really didn't understand, um, you know, the freedom of use and the limited resources that your members have got to manage open spaces. I mean, it was, to give you an example, you know, one of their key uh, requirements was to clean down all of the equipment after each use and to um, police and manage social distancing in playgrounds. Uh, and when I pointed out to them, you know, that some local authorities have in excess of 100 playgrounds in their area and they might have two or three people to, to maintain them, um, I, I think it, it set them back a little bit. So anyway, they, they issued the guidance on the Friday, I think it was, and within days, we were inundated, as I suspect. We're also inundated. Hi, Claire, how are you doing? Yeah, I did actually, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, I don't know if you... Are you, are you discussions, uh, MHCLG. MH, I wish they changed the name, That's, it's a mouthful. Um, and what became apparent was there was very little chance of getting those guidelines changed in a very short space of time. Um, but that in actual fact, the intent was that they were just guidelines. And so the first message that your members need to understand is the guidelines were not, are not mandatory. They are guidelines, they are recommendations and a possible suite of measures that um, a local authority could use, may use, to determine whether it was safe and appropriate to reopen a playground. But none of them were mandatory, save for the second point, which is very critical, is that a risk assessment, a COVID-19 specific risk assessment had to be carried out. Now, I, I'm not sure whether you know this, so I may be teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, but every play area should have a risk assessment carried out anyway. Every play area is unique in terms of its contents, its location, its capacity, etc. cetera. Um, and so, you know, in order to satisfy, should any claims be made on a local authority of any event, uh, occurs in a playground, an insurer would typically want to see or have evidence that a risk assessment had been carried out. So the requirement for a COVID-19 specific risk assessment might sound like um, 
something that they're ill-equipped to do. But most of them should should have been carrying out or should have had carried out on their behalf a risk assessment for their play areas. So what the government were asking for was a new risk assessment specifically to COVID-19, but not different to they would be carrying out for any other local authority facility. If they were opening offices, they'll have been doing risk assessments. You know, it's not something they shouldn't be familiar with. My own feeling, and, and you can probably chip in during Q&A about this, is I suspect the people who are feeling the most pain are the parishes, you know, where you, you might have Fred and Margaret and and you know, they, they just don't know how to put a risk assessment together. They're the people, I guess, I, I feel sorry for the most in all of this. But most large local authorities w- would have uh, the necessary skills, the necessary templates already put together to, to sort of put this together. So the risk assessment itself, um, the I personally would recommend that the COVID-19 risk assessment for playground reopening should mention or cover the elements of the government guidelines that are applicable to that play area. Um, You know, so for example, one that I don't see as a major issue is it talks about defining what the reasonably safe capacity of a play area is. I actually don't think that's unreasonable. And although people say, well, how am I going to do that? You know, there's a couple of things you could do very simply to come up with an estimate of capacity. The first is it's pretty easy to determine what the square meter is is of a play area. Even if the play area isn't bounded by um, fencing, you know, if it's if it's in an, an open area, you can pretty much take a view of you know, this part of it is the play area, measure it and come up with a square meter number. And a very simple way of doing it is say, well, if the government guidelines are currently one meter for social distancing, take the square meterage and divide it, you know, by a half. And, and you, you know, you, you'd, you'd get a number. So if it was 10 square meters, five people is probably a, a safe um, number. The important thing is in the risk assessment is to document your um, your working out. You know, it's, it's like any in your O levels. Doc, prove, document your working out. And so, if you determine that the safe square, you know, capacity for a ten meter playground is five, then show why social distancing is a meter. Therefore, within a meter, you know, half a meter between touch points. Therefore, that's five kids. The other way to do it would be to look at an item of and say one child per item of equipment. You know, or you as a local authority may say two child per. It's it's not the actual intrinsic number. It's to prove that the method of assessment has taken place and you've arrived at a number that um, is explainable. If you know, if it comes under scrutiny. Um, the next area I think that has caused the most discussion is around cleansing, because I've never, I haven't come across anybody yet who said, oh yeah, this is this is easy. We'll just go around and we'll clean it every hour. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, nobody, everybody realizes that is that is unworkable. But it's important in the risk assessment to say why it's unworkable. Okay, it's not just, you can't just say, we can't do it. There has to be the reasoning behind it. Um, And incidentally, why do you need these reasoning? It's always a just in case. And typically the people who may want to see it are the insurers. You know, I I actually, the government's not gonna come around and say, can you show me your risk assessment? It's, It's typically the insurers who may want to see it if something happens. Um, and so on cleaning, I think it's important that they document the reasons why it's not possible. And again, it's the example that I, I've just given. You know, how many play areas do you have to cover? Um, how many people do you have to do it? Therefore, practically, how many times would cleaning be possible? And, you know, straight away you get into, well, that's not possible. And then you start to think about, well, how 
as soon as you've cleaned it, somebody uses it, it's therefore unclean again. Therefore, it, it becomes a, a, an unusable metric. But again, it's the working out that's important that you, you include. Uh, the, the next thing has been a lot of talk about hand sanitizers. You know, some of our members have started flogging these things, um, you know, and good luck to them. Um, some of them are quite elaborate. Um, I, I just, I personally, and it's a personal thing, so please, I just don't see it. Um, if, if a local authority wants to provide a hand sanitizer on the, you know, at the entrance to a play area or at the entrance to a community center or community park, that, that's for them. But they then have to bear in mind that they've got to maintain it. They've got to top it up with hand sanitizer. And I think they've got to be very conscious that so far as I am aware, and, and you all may be able to tell me different, but the only hand sanitizer that is proven currently has a 90% plus alcohol content. Um, and it's flammable. Um, and if if you know and are aware of your local parks and playgrounds, um, there's nothing the youths like better than something they can set fire to. Um, and so the thought of all these hand sanitizers going up in flames is, is something that um, fills me with dread. And so I, I think, again, a reasonable risk assessment would say we have considered the use of hand sanitizers, but find them un unpractical in our setting following reasons um, and so once you start to go through all of these things you know i think there's another one there about a booking system um, uh, when you start going through them you, you quickly get to the, the point that pretty much all of them apart from the capacity are, um, are just unfeasible for a local authority and so you get to the bottom of the checklist maybe you add the capacity and then you get to well we're going to need some signage um, to put in place because we have to devolve the responsibility onto the users and the parents. And in the last week, I would say the vast majority of local authorities and, and certainly parishes that I've spoken to have gone down that route. They're still not happy about it because it's an expense putting up the signs, then it's an expense that typically nobody budgeted for and they don't have the money for them. But they sort of accept that that's where they've got to get to. There's quite a few now examples out there of, of good signage. Um, you know, we, we put a couple on um, on our document. There's a few on the website. There's a bunch of them out there on social media. A lot of the local authorities, and particularly the parishes, have very proudly sort of posted them and said, hey, look, you know, this is our signage. Um, so I think that's the main thing. You get you get down through it all to let's put this signage in place and, and let's make sure that the signage clearly points out um, that it's down to individual uh, responsibility. And if you think about it, so a parent, a grandparent, a guardian of any type taking a child to the play area, um, the signage should be there saying, well, use your own hand sanitizer. There should be no more than 10 children at any one time. So if they're informed, it's easy to count 10 people. Looks like there's 15. I, I shouldn't allow Johnny over the fence to, to play in the playground and so on. And, and that's pretty much where it's got to. Um, I'd probably stop there, but one, one point just before I do stop. I've been asked a number of times in the last week or so about what's my biggest concern and am I not concerned, and particularly, you know, the press keep asking this, am I not concerned that we're promoting children to go into an unsafe environment? And, um, I, you know, I can only look at the evidence that's out there and the evidence says that uh, children are the least affected medically by this than, than any other um, you know, portion of the population, and that you're probably more chance of a, of a child to, to be affected by this than they are by uh, being hit by lightning. So I, you know, I don't see that. I do see an issue if um, you know the parents and the guardians don't socially distance themselves as they go and they, you know sit around the park, um, and I'm sure we've all witnessed that now. Um, so that, you know, that's a bit of a concern. My biggest concern 
is the fact that all of these areas have been unused for a considerable amount of time. Um, you know, you're all aware of it because you'll have seen it as well. Um, you'll have seen, you know, they look like crime scenes, <laughs> or they, they have done. You know, they've got the tape wrapped around them. Um, some of the local authorities that actually have the um, the resources available may have even taken the, the swings off the chains. Some of them have tied the swings back and so forth. Um, my biggest fear is that you know, an accident occurs. My biggest fear is that people use them um, when they're not ready to be used, that they're put back into use and, you know, I don't know, a bearing sticks on a roundabout and a child falls off. And I think that much of issues arising from accidents, the equipment hasn't been maintained or inspected or, or, or whatever, then by COVID-19 um, transmission. So I, I think, you know, I think that's that's probably as much speech as, as you want, Charlotte. Um, back to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. I think um, okay. Great. Hopefully um, everyone could hear that okay and saw the quite um, some interesting bits and pieces there from from Mark from API. So uh, we've got with us in the room John uh, Dalton from the Register and Play Inspectors. Are you there, John? I am, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. And then we've got four um, representatives from local authorities to form our kind of Q&A panel today. So perhaps if you'd like to introduce yourselves, if I, if I read your names out. So Nicola first from Telford. Don't forget you may be on mute. Are you there, Nicola? Yeah, sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicola Allen from Telford Town Park, based in Shropshire. Great. Um, Sunish from Sunwell. Hopefully in the room somewhere. <coughs> Sunish, are you there? Okay. James, can you hear me? Yep, got you now. Sorry about that. IT, IT <laughs> issues. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Sunish. I'm the business manager at Samuel Valley. In Samuel Valley. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've got Tim Crawford from Broxo in Nottinghamshire. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, Tim Crawford. I'm the Parks and Green Spaces Manager at Broxo Borough Council. Okay, and then we've got Steve from South Kestephen in Lincolnshire. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Steve Frisby, Parks Manager for South Kestephen District Council. Great. So, um, I think John, over to you if you want to kick us off. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I, you can see who I am on the screen. I think I know a lot of the people in the room as well. Um, so, as I say, hello to everybody. Um, I can really kind of echo a lot of the stuff that, that Mark has said in that presentation. I think most of the stuff that he said is being fairly sensible. Um, we've been asked a, a huge amount of questions over the past couple of weeks um, and we've actually put our own uh, interpretation of that guidance out. I'm going to put a link to that uh, on the chat on the right hand side. So I've just literally just done that now. So um, I've got two positions really. I'm a director of the play inspection company, um, which is obviously a commercial company, but I'm also a board member of the Register of Play Inspectors International. Um, and I take up a number of positions with the RPII as well. Um, we, when this guidance came out, uh, we felt similar to, to how Mark and everybody else felt in that a lot of it was, was really kind of unfeasible. Um, and to begin with, my reaction when I first saw it was, wow, if they're going to put out something like that, then I don't think anybody's really got any choice but to keep the playground shut because we can't, we can't adhere to it or you can't adhere to it. So that was my kind of very initial reaction. But then as I kind of started going through it um, and, and actually kind of working our way through each of the kind of individual things that they've written, I, I, I kind of felt more that it was open to interpretation. And I think um, one of the things that we need to bear in mind is that 
a lot of the guidance that the government has put out, it's all been fairly generic um, and it has to be that way. So a lot of the stuff that they're kind of saying, you'll see the same stuff written in a restaurant setting and then in, in a completely different setting. And when you think about playgrounds, we do have obviously the types of playgrounds that you guys operate, which are generally kind of free to access where everybody can turn up. But we also need to remember that there are playgrounds out there that are in things like farm parks where people are paying to actually go to access those areas. So when the guidance talks about things like um, controlling numbers um, and maybe introducing a booking system and that kind of stuff, I think if you were a commercial operator of a farm park, which generally tends to have a massive playground, but they've also got a restaurant and they've also got um, lots of other types of experiences, then it is actually feasible for those guys to um, put in some kind of booking system. Um, and they can manage that and they've got staff on site and they can they can they can do those things. But for you guys that have playgrounds that are unstaffed, unmanned, we don't have people stood around on the playground gate saying one in, one out. We can't we can't police it in any way. So I think we can we can kind of exclude ourselves from that. So with the the RPII, there was kind of four of us. We set up a subcommittee on the RPII and we went through all of the um, pieces of guidance that were provided and in that document that uh, I've just put the link to if you go through it, it we basically kind of talk you through our interpretation um, of what they've written down so things like uh, introducing capacity I think we've said on our document that we'd recommend one active user per item of equipment so when I say active user you could have a child and a supervisor um, which is similar to what, what Mark has said um, obviously that is one way of doing it but you could have a piece of equipment which is absolutely huge um, and that's why these things need to be done on, a, on, a, on an individual side basis we, we can't really have a, an approach that one risk assessment is going to cover 100 playgrounds that you manage I think certainly like in Sandwell I know Synergy have got the Sandwell Valley Park um, which has got some absolutely massive pieces of equipment on it so to say that you could only have one child on one of those giant pieces of equipment would be a little bit ridiculous. Um, but then we have the, the more traditional types of playgrounds, it, 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 there it becomes a little bit more sensible. Um, so yeah, so what we try to do is, is kind of go through all of the different pieces of guidance that have been written down and try and give you like a sensible interpretation. But as Mark said, um, from a legal perspective, you need to make sure that you've got that risk assessment in place. That That is something that you have to do. Um, and I think one of our biggest concerns, I've probably done about 20 different radio interviews over the last two weeks talking about this. Um, and my biggest concern is similar to Mark's in that I don't think it's necessarily a problem with, with local authorities that have a lot of experience of dealing with playgrounds. But some, of the, some of the measures that we've seen to take playgrounds out of action are nothing short of shocking. Like I've seen some horrendous things. I saw... We had, I've got a photograph that I could share if anyone was interested. Someone's got an embankment slide, a parish council, when they put a piece of Harris fencing and tied it onto the top of it, so you can slide on the un, down, you can slide underneath between the Harris fence and the slide itself, and that was their way of taking this playground out of action. So that that in itself is far more dangerous than COVID uh, poses to to children, I think. Um, and then the other thing that we've noticed is that a lot of the parish councils where we've had inspections in the programme, so say it should have been done in May, should have been done in June, they've turned around and said, well, the playgrounds are shut, therefore I don't need to inspect it. So now we've got a situation where there's lots and lots and lots of playgrounds that just haven't been inspected at all. People are wanting to open them up um, and people are kind of banging on our door saying, well, I know I told you I didn't want you in June, but I want you now, I want you today, today I want you tomorrow. And obviously... There's only so much that an inspection company can do. We, we've got about 16 inspectors on the road um, and they're all absolutely flat out at the moment that it's not possible for us to react to every single inquiry that comes in like that. So it's going to it's going to be a case of waiting until we can we can get some presence there. Um, so, so that's certainly something to consider. And I, I will point out one of the things that it did say in the in the government guidance, whilst, whilst a lot of the government guidance was um fairly stringent one of the things that it does say in the text is that whilst we know that this virus can stay around and stick on hard surfaces particularly when they're indoors for a few days 
when you've got a hard surface which is outside and exposed to UV light and rain, um, then the evidence suggests that it's not going to stick around anywhere near as long. So our advice is, look, I, I don't think you can realistically stand there and clean a piece of playground equipment every time that somebody touches it. So cleaning doesn't really make much sense. So from our perspective, it would be much more sensible to try and encourage members of the public to take their own sanitizer with them um, and encourage them to use that, wash their hands thoroughly before and after they visit a playground, encourage them to make sure that their children don't touch their face after they touch the piece of equipment um, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and all of that can be communicated via signage, it can be communicated via social media, like any kind of media channel that you've got uh, on top of the signage we'd recommend using as well. Um, and, and that's about it really, I think, from me. Perfect. Thanks, John. That's, that's really good. Uh, some really good, interesting points there. Um, so over to our panel. I uh, don't know who wants to kick off. Perhaps you just want to share your experience and where you're at with this process so far, uh, each of you. James, I'm happy to go first. Tim Crawford. Um, Great. Thanks, yeah, Tim. I, yeah, I, I feel quite reassured sat here because uh, I'm, I'm sort of pleased to say that we have followed all the the, the comments and guidance that's been uh, been talked about just then. Uh, we have reopened all our play areas now. We've done that on a, on a phased reopening approach. Uh, we did a systematic um, inspection of all the areas on a, on a one by one basis. Uh, they were all then cleaned. What we did find is that the play areas that had got uh, that had got a bark or a loose fill surface had accumulated a, a, a massive amount of weed and grass growth uh, over the three month period. So that all had to be uh, removed, the bark raked and, uh, and cleaned out. And then we did uh, risk assessments for, for the individual areas. Um, I, I've, I haven't done, um, what, what I have done is, is categorise them into different size areas and then work out the capacity for uh, what I've classed as large, medium and small areas. And I've, I've based it on a um, five metre by five metre area per child. And that's given me sort of um, levels of usage that I consider to be safe. Now, that's quite seems a bit different from the figures that were just banded about earlier on. But that's uh, that's the levels that we've gone with. And we've put site specific signs on all the play areas, uh, indicating what we think the usage level is suitable for that area. And we've we've gone with a, a sort of approach where what we will do, stating what the council is responsible for in terms of the, the safety element, uh, emptying the bins, raking the bark, and then a section that is what we need you to do, which is putting the emphasis on the on the users of the equipment and things like uh, respecting others, maintaining social distancing, uh, if children are waiting, limiting time, uh, cleaning hands, putting emphasis on on the on people using it to provide their own sanitizers and wipes, uh, avoid touching face, catching coughs and sneezes, um, taking wipes and tissues home with them, not putting them in the litter bin on site, um, not eating and drinking, and cleaning the hands when they get home. So. We, we tried to follow as much of the guidance as we could and put it into our own sort of format. And we've put signs, A3 correct signs on, on every entrance to every play area. Um, and we've publicised on social media, that's what we've done. Um, and generally it seems to have gone now well and been respected. Great, thanks Tim. If, if only we could um, have such faith that all of our customers, as it were, would uh, would stick to what we asked them to do. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> um, right, who's next? Steve, Sanish or Nicola? Yeah, I, I can go if you like. Yeah, Steve, yes. Um, yeah, I'm kind of reassured by that as well, John, in terms of the RPII recommendations. In fact, we've had a look at your um, guide document um, and as a, a summary of what government puts out there, it's, it's absolutely excellent and, and demonstrates how common sense um, should be used. In this. So it's really useful. Um, a bit like Tim, we are reassured. Um, I think generally we are kind of complying with those recommendations. We completed risk assessments, both the generic one and ones specific to, to each site, because each site is different. We've got 40 across 365 square miles of our district. Um, the, the thing that I suppose that I have learned from this, and I'll pass on to my colleagues who are dealing with this anyway, is that um, 
perhaps we ought to use a slightly different formula in terms of working out the the capacity per site. Um, you mentioned about one person and the carer per piece of equipment. Um, I think that's quite a cautious, cautious, cautious approach, but but probably it's it's one that Joe Public would quite readily understand. So so we'll be having a look at that. Um, yeah, we've got signs, uh, obviously providing the public with information on site as to what they should be doing and what their responsibilities are in terms of hand washing, not touch your face, go home if you don't feel very well, etc. It's all good common sense uh, information that should be out there anyway, um, but have it on site makes makes complete sense. So um, yeah, we've just got to watch this space and and we've just got to contain kind of um, a continual kind of monitoring system, which we have. We're looking at putting an additional resource in this next week and the week after, well, the next few weeks actually, just to monitor the use of our play equipment and, and playgrounds so that if we need to, we, we can adapt our approach on that. So I think that's me done for that. Great, thanks, Steve. And uh, just before we move on, Steve and um, mm. Tim, did you open sort of straight away or fairly quickly or uh, sort of, I know, Tim, you said you had a phased process. You're, you're sharing your screen, by the way, Tim. I hope that's deliberate. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> before we see something we shouldn't. It's on your email, don't worry, Tim. <laughs> We, we we were fairly quick out of the starting blocks. Obviously, there's some uh, political pressure there for us to move quickly on things. Um, so, yes, we we were very quick out of the starting blocks to get back up and running again. Great. Okay. Uh, yeah, just, just from our point of view, yes, we, we did a face opening and um, uh, we didn't open any. It, it was the uh, 7th of July. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, last Monday was the first one that we opened. So we went yeah. a week without opening. Great. Okay, Sunish, Nicola, over to you. Who is next? Okay, if I go, Sunish. Yeah, yeah. Um, we basically took the approach of a phased opening, uh, similar to everyone else, um, with the four district parks and the town park opening last Friday. In terms of the risk assessments, when the guidance came out, we actually worked through that and did a risk assessment based on the guidance, which uh, we costed up cleaning and all those sorts of things. And then it came to a point, obviously, that that's not going to be practicable. And then the risk assessments were reviewed in terms of um, more based on a district small park and the larger parks. Um, but we didn't do the uh, capacity exercise. Um, that's been more put forward to the visitor in terms of if the play area is crowded to actually come back later. So that's how they, the um, process has worked so far um, for us. And over this next couple of weeks, the smaller parks in districts, because we've got over 120 will start to be opened gradually as well. Um, I must say from the town park's perspective, um, having been there at the weekend and monitoring it because we do have on-site uh, team there, although we're not actually going into the play areas and, you know, advising uh, visitors with lots of signage and stickers and actual pieces of play equipment. Um, but, but on the whole, um, the public are respecting um, the request to, you know, not go in there if it's crowded, um, keep the social distancing and those sorts of things. So, so far, so good. Um, it will be the, the big test will be the kids actually officially being on holiday from this week and the weather improving. Great. Thanks, Nicola. OK, yeah. and last but not least, Lisa Nish, and then we'll go over to the, the questions that are appearing in the chat. Thanks, James. So... I suppose from our perspective in Sandwell, we haven't opened our playgrounds as of yet. Um, nothing's open. But as people probably had over COVID, uh, we sort of closed, chained off, fenced off um, a number of play areas. People were pulling the fences down, and jumping over the fences and jumping in and getting them actually playing on the equipment anyway. Um, we did obviously um, put signage up as well on a lot of our play equipment, but people just chose to ignore them. 
um, and continue to utilise the spaces. Um, so I suppose from our perspective, the guidelines, as they came out, didn't give us enough time or much time to sort of start getting things ready. So what we've done is in Sandwell, we created a bit of a, a group, um, and our colleagues from Sandwell are on uh, the, the, this webinar as well. And we sort of started discussing um, in conjunction with other neighbouring local authorities in terms of what they're doing. So Liz, um, Mikla, um, Daniel, we've looked at what they're doing and sort of try to incorporate and have a bit of a working group between ourselves. So sharing risk assessments and stuff like that. But we're all sort of trying to sort of achieve the same thing um, and working together. Obviously, we're three months behind um, with where we should be in terms of normal regime. So cleansing wasn't an option really for us. Um, so, and, and like people said, we've never cleansed our playgrounds before. We've started doing our risk assessments um, and the way our authority have done it is we have to go through Reset Recovery Board as we start um, releasing or, and opening different phases, so playgrounds being one of them. So what we've had to do as part of that recovery plan is we sort of consult with public health colleagues, um, health and safety, um, premise management and HR, etc. So when we are sort of happy that we've got everything in place, it will go through that recovery board for sign off. Uh, which gives us peace of mind that we've got everything in place. But we will obviously um, be having signage in place, having um, numbers on site um, in terms of how many should be utilising it. I think the thing for me or one of my concerns is, you know, Sandwell's quite a deprived borough. So some of our deprived areas necessarily whilst other areas will have sort of um, people will take hand sanitizers with them. Will the um, sort of younger, younger people have sanitizers with them when they're using our play areas? don't think they will. So that's that's a slight concern that I've got. Uh, but obviously, what we don't want to do is set ourselves up with providing hand sanitizers in these areas. And then we've also got concerns around um, potentially how the close proximity of some of our play areas, so toddler swings, etc., are more than a metre. So whilst we can try and signpost people not to utilise that bit of equipment, um, necessarily people aren't going to adhere to that, but all we can do is our best. Um, John alluded to it before, we've got a massive playground over at Sandmore Valley. And the adventure playground and you know trying to limit and restrict the amount of people utilizing it will be difficult but you know what we can do is our best collectively so um that's it from uh, our perspective from samuel james thank you great thanks thanks all so just to pick up on a couple of questions in the chat and anyone else who, who's got anything particularly they want to address feel free to do put something in the chat so mainly the three questions from Matt, Colin and Phil um, about the this issue with numbering um, the sort of capacity of the playground. And obviously we've heard that some people have gone down that route and some haven't. I know here at Nottingham we haven't. We decided to take the view um, that we just said to people, you know, please come back another time if it's busy rather than putting an actual number on each site. That was our, our version in our risk assessment. John, is that something you wanted to perhaps pick up or comment on at all? What you thought was the, the most appropriate approach, whether we leave it up to the user, as we are with the hygiene things, or whether we try and give people a number to work to, and would they stick to it if, they, if we did? Yeah, I think um, it, it's a difficult one. There's going to be different methods of achieving the same thing. So obviously in our document, we've said you could consider one child or one active user and one supervisor per item of equipment, but it's a very loose recommendation. So the reason that we said that was because when you think about like a lot of the pieces of equipment for a swing, for instance, that might have two seats. If you said there's one user on that swing, then you've automatically just encouraged social distancing. Um, and you could have a Springer, which was one person anyway, a roundabout would be, you wouldn't really want any more than one person on that. But like I said before, if you've got a massive piece of equipment, then that doesn't really make sense. But we felt that it was something that was kind of easy to communicate um, and something that we felt that the parents would be able to instantly kind of look at and see. Um, but there, there, there's different ways of doing things. And we're certainly not saying that you have to follow that approach. But from a legal perspective, you just need to show that you've considered it. Um, so some people have kind of gone to the extent of taking a set of chains and seats off a swing. So you've only got one seat present in a bay. Um, so people are doing things like that. And, and everyone's going to interpret these things in different ways. Um, but I think the onus needs to go on the on, on onto the parents. I know that some people have said, look, we've got we've got no way of policing this. But my argument to that would be that when I walk down the street, 
if I'm too close to somebody, I will normally stop and kind of move out of the way or they'll stop and they'll move out of my way. And we automatically kind of have this social distancing thing happening. Now, nobody's telling me to do that. Nobody's telling the other person to do that. Nobody's enforcing it. But at the same time, we all do it. So I think generally, especially with something like this, people are well aware of like the, the social distancing things that we're meant to have in place. And I think if we put that signage up and if we communicate it to users, then I think a lot of people are going to be sensible about it. You're always going to get a few that, that aren't going to be sensible about it. Um, and I think one other thing to potentially consider is that if you have got a massive site, and again, going back to Sandwell Valley, a huge site like that, it's going to be incredibly difficult to manage the amount of users that come onto that site. But if you have got a destination park, then the health and safety law talks about doing everything which is reasonable and practicable. And I think if you've got a massive site like that, you can put measures in place. But I also think it would be reasonable to maybe have someone go down there and see if these guidance see if these pieces of guidance are actually being adhered to and if it and if what you're doing isn't working then you might need to consider doing something else and as i said i don't think you need to do that on every site but if you've got a huge destination park then i think that's maybe something that you might need to consider yeah i think that's an interesting point actually it's one of the things um that we uh, were encouraged by our unions here in nottingham to put in our risk assessment uh, was factoring in what's going on locally. So, you know, if there were to be a local spike in the R rate or, you know, let alone a lockdown situation, um, then we might need to reclose and that the risk assessment does have a section which covers that, that what is the local intel, not just the national picture that might affect what we're doing locally. You've got to do that. And I mean, I was in Nuneaton last week with um, David Truslove and he said exactly that. They, they've got an area where there was like a a kind of localised outbreak and, and they've made the decision there not to open the parks in that area and they've got a bit of stick for it but at the end of the day that you've got to do what you've got to do and they've opened parks up in different areas but they haven't opened them up in that particular area so that's where your risk assessment is is going to is going to be variable it's not going to be a fixed risk risk assessment I think it needs to be a flexible risk assessment and obviously as things change as things progress you're going to need to potentially do more or you might be able to do less, but you, you're definitely not going to be able to just do one risk assessment and then completely forget about it. Yeah, exactly. And I think the removing equipment is interesting as well. Again, it's something we have done, although we've not done the numbering of um, capacity. We we have taken down one of every two swing seats, but in fact, that's almost been the biggest challenge is finding somewhere to store 200 odd swing seats. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. Um, so uh, the other question, one of the other questions we've got, um, well, if I go to Lawrence's first, which is about controlling numbers on very large space net, I mean, any very large piece of equipment, I guess we'd say that comes down to the general guidance and the onus on the parents, you know, to have some control at the point when they enter the playground, if, if indeed they do. I know, I think there's an interesting social study here for someone. I was at a site myself at the weekend, a Seven Trent playground, in fact, which was closed. Uh, and it remained closed and no one on it for the first two hours that I was there near it. But as soon as one person went in and hopped over the or moved the barrier out of the way, the floodgates <laughs> opened. It was amazing. Um, so it's just interesting, that kind of social element of whether people want to stick by the rules or, or choose to take their own decisions. But in, in terms of controlling numbers, Lawrence, I think that would be, you know, the onus is on the parents, I'd, I'd assume. Um, would you agree, John? Yeah, absolutely. You can you can only go so far. You can only do so much. But you're you're. This is the point we're trying to get across. You you can't have somebody stood at the gate of every single playground watching what's going on, hmm. and telling somebody, "Oh, sorry, you have got too many people on that piece of equipment. Please get off." It just isn't. Gonna, it just isn't going to work. So you consider it in your risk assessment. Um, you document your findings. Um, you justify what you've written, you put your control measures in place, which would be, for instance, signage and communication via, via social media, um, and then you monitor and you review. Okay, great. So the other question we've got, um, which Alison has mentioned, now Steve uh, and Nicola and I were talking about this just before the meeting began, actually, was about water parks and splash pads. As I know, obviously, the guidance now also allows for those to open, and I did a bit of looking into this myself for our facilities last week, which I have to say I'm making a big push on not opening. Um, the guidance, maybe John, you can enlighten us if you if you know, but the guidance I could find seems to be an interpretation of what you can find for other stuff. There doesn't seem to be anything specific. There's the stuff around swimming pools and gyms and leisure centres, 
And the, the, my interpretation of that is that you may need to go as far as, um, as well as limiting numbers, track and trace type um, registers of visitors. Do you, do you have any intel on that? Um, yeah, similar to that, really. I, I, personally, I don't think it's a good idea because if you open up one of them, it's going to be, um, you, if you've got a sunny day, that place is just going to get absolutely filled with visitors. Um, and I don't think you're going to have any chance of controlling social distancing uh, with that open and with that kind of situation so obviously it's down to each individual to, to make that decision but I think your risk assessment because of the way that we know that those types of places will be used you, you probably have to put some kind of man in some some kind of supervision in place if you do want to open it and it then kind of becomes a little bit unachievable I think. Yeah I'd agree and I think my, my other concern here as well as the the um, cost and resources needed to manage that and if it's really the right thing to do was that actually by the time we commission those facilities and get them opened up we'll probably have you know even with British weather allowing a three week long season at best and actually is that really a you know a sensible move in the current financial climate so Steve and um, Nicola you've obviously both got similar facilities any thoughts from your end on what whether you are looking to open or not or getting pressure to open perhaps? Um, from Telford, the, the park's perspective, we've been asked to uh, look at it and to be fair, I was waiting for this meeting to see what everyone else was doing as well. But I've got um, the same concerns. How do we manage it? The, um, you know, it's, it's basically the honeypot sort of draw for the park and um, it also then interferes with other access routes that we've created for one-way systems into the toilets, those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, I will be feeding back based on what, what's been discussed today, really. Yeah. Sunish? So what we've done, James, for, for the Sandwell Valley and Dartmouth, we've got water play, a large water play in Dartmouth Park. Uh, and what we've chose to do is we did a report um, back in April to our cabinet member to say basically for the financial costs um, surrounding actually opening the facility we we think it'd be best to leave it closed this year and then we had approval for that so we won't be opening ours um, in Dartmouth Park. Great and just just on on that note then is the is the public message out there about that or do you think there's still going to be quite a lot of expectation on you from the public? I think there'll probably be some expectation I think the, the key one at the moment is obviously out, opening our playgrounds up again um, but I think my colleagues were saying it's going to be really difficult to be able to manage um, the numbers on there um, as the weather sort of does improve and, and, and during the holiday. So I think we've, we've sort of taken that sort of hit and thought, you know what, it's not worth taking that risk um, by, by putting users at, uh, at risk, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, I was going to say our council have taken a slightly different view on that in that they are really keen to obviously get our water play facilities open. Um, as I said earlier on, though, what we have done is introduce this um, operative that's going to be monitoring both the play areas that we've got within our town here at Grantham and the water play facilities over the next week or two. And if things do get out of hand and people don't comply with the social distancing requirements, we will close the facilities. So that's like that. give them a chance. Give people the, um, the opportunity to prove that obviously they're willing to comply with the rules, and if they don't, you know, we'll, we'll just have to close them. Yeah, okay, seems fair. Great, thanks, everyone. Um, did any of our panelists or John want to? We've, I don't think we've got any other questions at the moment. Has anything come up? Um, Mark has just asked, Can we all agree we're not opening splash pads? Well, I think Steve's just put a spanner in that work, Mark, but maybe the rest of us can all agree. Um, certainly, I know it's sometimes of use, isn't it, to when we get political pressure on these things to just refer to what other authorities in and around us and around the region are doing. But we'll just not mention Lincolnshire for now. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I'll use the, ref the rest of you as a reference point when I talk back to the Cabinet. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was really useful. Thank you very much. I think there's an element of this and, and with them. Um, uh, the question just in from from Stafford just about you know what is the right thing to do as well in these instances whether yeah. there's public or political pressure or not is it really yeah. the right thing to do to open a facility that we know on a busy day will be absolutely rammed and you know I'd love to well, say we'll get to weather there, from my point of view hopefully we'll prove that point I know what it'll say chaos <laughs>
Okay, and we've got a note there, Alison, just saying that North Hearts are opening theirs um, next week, by the looks of it. So, yeah, one to watch, perhaps, as well. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, thanks to our four panellists. Unless there's anything else or from John that they want to say, we're going to take a 10-minute break or so now. Um, so just for me, quickly. Sorry, it's yep. John again. Thanks, John. Um, just to say that if anybody wants any specific advice, if you want to contact me directly, um, I've just put my email address up on the screen now. So... If anybody does want me, you're more than welcome to, to get in touch directly. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Really, really appreciate that. So we're about five minutes ahead of schedule, which is great. So um, 10 minute break now. Go and stretch your legs, make yourself a cup of tea. Uh, and uh, we'll see you back here at 10 minutes past three, if that's OK. Thanks all.